Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is my quarantine hair. And I would like to welcome you to the fourth lecture in the summer 2020 offering of EC3084 Signals and Systems. In the second lecture, we looked at unit step functions. And in the third lecture, we looked at Dirac delta functions. So the unit step functions were zero up until a particular point, at which point they changed to one. And the particular place they did that was at t equals zero. And we're going to try to avoid talking about what exactly happens at this transition. The Dirac delta functions themselves are very strange. They're not really functions. They are generalized functions. They're zero everywhere except for at the origin, where something very strange happens. We have something that's infinitely thin and more or less infinitely tall. But as we discussed last time, trying to think of it as infinity at the origin can lead to some confusion. These are basically defined by the way they react to integrals. So if we integrate them over their range, or basically any range that's containing zero, we get one, otherwise we get zero. So if you haven't seen that second or third lecture, go back and take a look at it. So let's think for a second about what it might mean to integrate our Dirac delta function from minus infinity up to a value of t. If I tried to write something like this, I might get some confusion because I'm using t in two places. Technically speaking, this is not ambiguous because this t is a bound variable, which would be different than this free variable out here, but this will be awfully confusing. So instead, let's rewrite this by putting the t up here, and we'll now use tau as our variable of integration to try to avoid any confusion here. So let's think about what this turns into. If I have my delta function that's sitting here doing this weird thing at t equals zero. Let's think about what I'm integrating over. So let's think about what happens when I do this integration. Well, it, of course, it depends on what t is. So if I integrate up to t and t is less than zero, then I haven't gone up to the point where the delta function is. The portion that I'm integrating doesn't include it, so I get zero. However, what if my t is bigger than zero? In this case, I'll go do, 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 come up to t. The delta function would be included in that range from minus infinity to t, and I'll get one out. Now, if you look at that, there's a function we've looked at that sort of looks like this. Well, what is it? It's that unit step function. The unit step is zero for t less than zero, and it's one for t bigger than zero. Now I have to be a little bit careful. The way we've defined it earlier is we said, oh, we'll say that for the purposes of this class, we'll let the unit step function be one for t bigger than or equal to zero. That turns out to be notationally convenient for some things we'll be doing later on in the class. So to make this work, I might put a little extra note here. I might put a little t plus here to indicate that at a particular t, we are including that particular t in this integration range in order to tag that impulse function at that point. Very rarely will you see people write something like this so explicitly to make that work. They'll generally just write minus infinity to t, delta t, dt like thus. Now, I didn't pull this out of nowhere. This is the kind of thing we think about when trying to figure out how to do calculus. We see that the integral of the Dirac delta function is the unit step function. And if I think about that a little more, I might say, okay, well, let's think about the fundamental theorem of calculus that derivatives and integrals are reverse operations of each other. So if I take the derivative of a unit step function, I can get the delta function. And this seems incredibly strange, and it is. So my unit step function has a discontinuity. And your calculus professor in your freshman calculus class probably told you that you couldn't take derivatives of unit step functions. And sort of technically speaking, you can't, but sort of uh, you can. 
if I take the derivative of this, this gives me a delta function, since if I integrate this delta function, I get a unit step function. Of course, the big caveat in writing a statement like this is, this is a generalized function. It is not a standard function that maps a domain to a range. Statements like this only make sense in terms of how they react to integrals. So the thing on the left here equaling the thing on the right makes sense from the standpoint of if you integrate the thing on the left and you similarly integrate the thing on the right, you'll get the same thing out. Now, once we've defined that, though, that lets us do some fun things. Suppose I wanted to take the derivative of cosine pi t u t. So what does this look like? A cosine is going to do a nice, wave, happy, wavy thing. Let me write 0, 1, 2, 3. So what is this at 0? It's going to be 1. What is it going to be at t equals 1? Well, it's going to be minus 1, and so on. At 2 pi, it's going to be like thus and like thus. And what I have is 0 crossings here. I'll have a sinusoidal form going down like this, and then coming up like this, and coming down like that, and so on. And if I had just the cosine by itself, I would have something symmetric coming out the other side here. But I have this ut that's chopping it off at that particular point. So it's zero below here. So what's the derivative of this function look like? Well, we're going to need these new ideas to handle the fact that there's a discontinuity here. Let's say I'm going to say the thing up here equals doo -doo -doo, woo. Let's continue down here. So I'm going to take the first factor here and multiply it by the derivative of the second factor. And then we'll take the derivative of the first factor and multiply it by the second factor. All right. So the first factor is cosine pi t. What's the derivative of ut, the second factor? Well, that is our delta function. OK, so the next thing I need to do is to take the derivative of the first term. So I'm adding this now. We'll add the derivative of this term by the chain rule. A pi is going to pop out in front. And oh, I always screw this up. It's not a plus because we're taking the derivative of a cosine, which is actually a minus sign. So I'll write minus sine pi t times the second factor, which is ut. And that's all well and good, but I can actually simplify this a little bit by saying, ah, we have a function multiplied by a delta. The delta is going to clear out everything that isn't at zero. So the only place that this particular term here is meaningful is at the place where t equals zero, because everything else is going to get zeroed out. And cosine of zero is one. So my first term is actually going to be one times delta t, which I'll just go ahead and write here as delta t. And then I can rewrite the rest of this expression. My pi sine pi t ut. Now let's plot that and try to figure out if that makes sense. So let's place an axis here. I'm going to have a 0, 1, 2, 3. OK, that wasn't spectacular. Let me put in some midpoints here. So I write this 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. OK, so instead of a cosine, I have a sine, but it's a minus sine. Instead of the first hump of the sign going up, it's going to go down. And so it goes down like this, and then it comes up, and then it goes down, and then it comes up. Again, if this was a sign by itself, I would have stuff over here, but I don't, so it's zero over here. Do, 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 do. And this will have a height of pi. So it has an amplitude of pi. And this makes sense. First thing it does is it starts going down, but it doesn't go down very quickly. And then when I hit this point, at this halfway point, it's going down as fast as it can. So we get the most negative derivative. When we hit this point, it's switching direction. So we're back at a derivative of 0. Here it's now going up as fast as it can. So when we go down here, we see that 
the derivative, ah, uh, yes, it's going up as fast as we can. So here it hits the maximum here and so on. The one thing I have to be careful with is there is this jump here. We have to think about what's happening with that jump. So how is it that it can suddenly go whoop, like there? Well, that's what the delta does. And I'll draw it like this. So we'll have a weight of one like here. I don't really have this to scale very well. This looks like pi over two, but it should actually be a little smaller than that. But you get the idea. The issue is that no matter how I'm trying to scale this, this pi and this one doesn't really exist on the same scale anyway. The delta function is existing in a different conceptual space than the rest of this function. So that's how you can take the derivative of a discontinuous function.